السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Just before introducing the next speaker, I would like to let you know that we have a WhatsApp group. Please, if you have any question, the number is out there on the on my left side. Just join to the group and submit your question. It's really a pleasure to introduce the next guest speaker. The next guest speaker is Professor Amr Al Husseini. Professor Amr Al Husseini is Uh, he was graduated from Mansoura University. Uh, we worked together in Mansoura Religion for Center as a resident, as an assistant lecturer, a lecturer, assistant professor of nephrology. Uh, he migrated to the States. He got his uh, the board in inter American Board in Internal Medicine 2010, the American Board in Nephrology in 2012. Uh, first, I would like to thank Amri because actually he helped us he, uh, in uh, our application to a sistership program between our unit and his unit. Amri is now working as a professor of nephrology in Kentucky University. Uh, the title of his presentation is uh, Osteocyte Dysfunction and Renal Osteodystrophy, a Dynamic Process. Amri, please. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. I'm really pleased that uh, I'm here with you today, and I'm really thankful for the orga organizing committee and for the ISN uh, for me to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk today about something uh, maybe different, and my way of presentation might look also different. I'm going to talk about uh, the basic structure and function of renal osteodystrophy. And uh, as you know that we have four uh, different kinds of bone cells. We have the osteogenic cell, which is a stem cell that differentiate to osteoblast. Osteoblast is a bone forming cells. So if we need more bone formation, there is signals for osteoblast differentiation. Then when the osteoblast finish its function, it changed to an osteocyte, which is our interest of our talk today. Osteoclast, however, is very different cell because it comes out from the bone marrow. So osteogenic cell differentiate to osteoblast, osteoblast mature to osteocyte, while the osteoclast is a fusion of monocyte macrophage that comes out from the bone marrow. So the balance between osteoclast and osteoblast is very important to maintain normal bone health. And this happened because of this amazing cell called osteocyte. The osteocyte is the master that control both osteoblast and osteoclast function. The osteocyte lives inside lacuna so this is an osteon, which is the structural unit of the bone, like nephron, you know, for example, in the kidney. So inside this osteon, the osteocyte lives here in a lacuna and start to send these elongations, arms and leg of an ant. It looks like exactly like an ant. And this elongation is start to enter communicate with each other and form a network of cells. We call it the brain cell of the bone. So the osteoclast, we thought, you know, many years ago that the osteoclast antagonized the action of the osteoblast. But this wasn't true. Actually, the osteoblast and the osteoclast, they work together. Without osteoclast, we don't need osteoblast. Without bone resorption, we don't need bone formation. So the osteocyte control both osteoclast and osteoclast function. This means that it control bone formation and bone resorption. And this orchestra, this is, you know, very nice interplay between this all kind of cells because they all have the same target to maintain normal bone health. If you have imbalance 
in a favor of more bone formation or more bone turnover, we will be in, in trouble. So we have to maintain this balance, and this happens through the osteocyte function. Osteocyte secretes several hormones, several cytokines, molecules, and chemokines that control both the osteoclast and osteoclast function. Osteoclast is bone resorption cell. Why do we need bone resorption? We have to think that the bone is very dynamic structure. We may think that it's very slow or static organ, but this is not right. The bone is very active organ. And if the bone turnover is very high and bone formation rate is low, we end up by having osteoporosis. So we have to maintain normal function of both osteoclast and osteoblast, and this happens through baracrine signal from the osteocyte. Why do we need bone resorption? You remember that about 90% of our calcium stay in the bone. And what happens if we don't have enough calcium or extra cellular calcium, we can get arrhythmia, we can get tetany. So the osteoclast actually takes out the calcium from the bone on demand. This means that if we need extracellular calcium or other mineral like phosphate, this comes out by the action of the osteoclast. Here is the osteoclast. It lives on the surface of the bone. It doesn't dig inside the bone, it just sheaves the bone. It's multinucleated giant cell. It's very biological active cell, has a lot of mitochondria, and get attached to the bone through ruffled border and start to secrete a lot of acids and enzyme that degrades bone. After this, osteoblast comes in. So actually, osteoclast recruit the osteoblast after finishing its action, and usually it takes three to five days. Osteoblast comes in to repair the bone and you know to do its function and as bone modeling cell or remodeling cell. After it finished its action, now it transformed to inactive cell, which is usually a lining cell on the surface of the bone, but the majority of this osteobla osteoblast uh, get trapped inside the bone because it's, you know, it's fo it forms bone, it, uh, it secretes collagen, and this collagen gets calcified, and then it starts to send this elongation and arms and legs and form this network. Now its function changes from bone forming cells to an endocrine organ, one th of the most highly active organ, endocrine organ in our body is this osteocyte uh, uh, cells in our bone. And I was talking to Dr. Uh, Majid before the, the session and he was talking about playing tennis and how, how tennis and activities has a lot of secrets. I, I can tell you that osteocyte, the secret for osteocyte activation is exercise because it's mechanoreceptor, it's a pressure sensor, it sense the pressure, the workload, if you exercise, if you move, you will activate the osteocyte and the osteocyte orchestrates the action between this very nice, you know, osteoclast, which, which is very highly uh, active, you know, cells with a lot of mitochondria and, uh, you know, uh, 15 to 20 nucle nuclei start to secrete these acids and enzymes, mainly tartrate resistant acid phosphatase and cathapsin, and here it dissolves the collagen part, which is a protein of the bone. And when the protein dissolves, now we have this raw surface for the osteoblast to start to build the bone. It brings calcium, it brings phosphorus, and lay out the protein, which is a major component of the collagen. And this happens all the time, 24-7, you know, all weekdays and weekends, it doesn't stop. We are forming bones all the time. I can tell you, in three to five years, usually we replace all of our cortical bone. Just remember, three, five years ago, 
the cortical bone that you used to have is completely replaced by new bone. The cancellous bone usually takes longer than that, but it depends on the age and sex and many other factors. But in general, I can tell you that we replace completely our skeletal system several times in our life, at least maybe 10 times. We re replace all of our bones. And this happened because the interaction between the osteocyte and the sin basically send signals to the osteoclast and osteoblast. The problem with this, if there is imbalance in patient with renal osteodystrophy with this bone formation and bone resorption, this doesn't only happen in the bone, but also happen in the extra skeletal system, mainly in the blood vessel. And this is the reason that they calcify by various mechanisms, you know, either passively or actively, and they start to have exactly the same mechanism that constitute bone and form a bone happen in the blood vessel and they start to uh, secrete collagen and recruit uh, more calcium and mineral. Here is the secret cell, the osteocyte. If we don't exercise, if we don't ambulate, the cells is abnormal and start to send the abnormal signal for high turnover bone disease and less bone formation. So this balance is very important. We know that most of our patients, they start with, especially on dialysis patient and advanced CKD patient, they start to have high turnover bone disease as a compensatory mechanism because uh, hyperparathyroidism happened first to avoid hyperphosphatemia, start as compensatory mechanism, but if because they don't exercise, the osteocyte doesn't work well, they trans uh, transform from a compensatory mechanism or from adaptive to maladaptive mechanism. And this high turnover bone disease, if we over suppress this by using the calcium mimetic or vitamin D receptor agonist, what happens is we usually change our patient from high turnover to low turnover bone disease. How does the osteoblast and osteocyte control the osteoclast? By this amazing molecule called rank L. What's rank L? It's nuclear factor kappa B ligand that stimulates the rank, which is a receptor, surface Cell surface receptor uh, on the surface of the osteoclast. Osteoclast by itself cannot function without secretion of millions of molecules every day that uh, activate the osteoclast. So osteoplast and osteocyte activate the osteoclast because we need this bone resorption. And this happens mainly because of secretion of this rank L. But also osteocyte and osteoblast to counteract this, it secretes something different called osteoprotegrin, which is, we call it OBG or osteoprotegrin. So if there is excessive bone resorption, we secrete more OBG or osteoprotegrin that is a decoy for the receptor. It prevents the rank L from attachment with this multifaceted receptor on the surface of the osteoclast. So this, this balance is very important. If, you know, many of our patients, they end up by having severe osteoporosis and they lose their cortical and their trabecular bone, they f then they fracture. This can happen, uh, you know, in the long bone, but can happen also in the flat bone and vertebrae. Many of our patients, they lose their length and their height because their vertebrae in the thoracic and lumbar areas, they get collapse and they fracture. And sometimes we don't even know about this. They fracture their bone. And this is another reason that they are immobilized. They are disabled. They cannot exercise. They cannot, you know, uh, do uh, live healthy lifestyle or even walk. Sometimes, you know, majority of them, they are, you know, bedridden or in a chair. Uh, well it shares because of this fracture. So we need to control the high turnover bone disease. We need to control the osteoclastogenesis 
And we can do this by controlling this amazing molecule, which is the rank L and osteoprotegrin. In the past, we used to control this by the anti-resorptive agent that can kill the cells. But now we can do targeted therapy using monoclonal antibodies that can get attached to this molecule and control. Instead of killing the cell, we can control the function of the cell by uh, activating or inhibiting this rank ligand and this OBG uh, molecule that comes out from the osteoblast and osteocyte. I can tell you this fusion of monocyte macrophage that is going to be a big osteoclast. This cell is very hungry. It eats the bone just in a day or two. Usually, in average, it, this happens in three, five days, but with this kind of cells, it's, it can destroy the bone in three, five days. And usually, it takes for an osteoblast about more than 100 days to repair this bone loss that can happen in three days. Usually, the power of destruction is much higher than or easier than the power of, uh, you know, formation or the power of expansion. So we can control this by controlling the, these molecules or also by controlling the hormonal control of this mechanism of uh, bone resorption and, uh, and bone formation because BTH is one of the main reasons of this high turnover bone disease. We thought that BTH activates the osteoclast, but this, this doesn't happen. Actually, the BTH activates the osteoblast to secrete more rank L and rank L indirectly activate the osteoclast. So this amazing uh, hormonal control of the bone remodeling and bone turnover is very important. Here we used to, to use in the past bisphosphonates to control this high turnover bone disease, but the problem with bisphosphonates, it stays in the bone for almost six years in patients with normal kidney function. And in patients with kidney disease, it can stay longer and it kills the osteoclast and patient can end up by having low or adynamic bone disease. Now we can use more specific, we call it targeted therapy, which is monoclonal antibody like Borrelia, which is adenosumab that can control the bone resorption by controlling the rank L. By, you know, this monoclonal antibody against uh, the rank L get attached to this ligand and prevents this from activating the osteoclast through activating its receptor. So it's a decoy for the receptor. So this is, uh, has been proven to improve the osteoporosis and renal osteodystrophy, but this can cause hypocalcemia, especially in CKD patients. Another very interesting molecule is the sclerostin. Sclerostin comes out from the osteocyte. Sclerostin is very potent inhibitor for bone formation, very potent inhibitor for uh, the osteoblast. And it uh, causes uh, uh, bone loss through inhibition of bone formation because it's uh, a potent inhibitor or suppressant to the uh, wind signal, which is the major stimulant for our bone formation. It has a receptor on the osteoblast. It's lipoprotein receptor. There is different kind of receptor, but the most important are LRB4, 5, and 6. It gets attached to the, the surface, surface receptor on the osteoblast and inhibit the osteoblast from laying out the extracellular matrix, from laying out protein, which is the collagen, and it uh, prevent the osteoblast from newborn formation. So the osteoblast cannot function. In patients with chronic kidney disease, they have very high levels of sclerostin, and sclerostin in patients with kidney disease is the main reason uh, that they can have low turnover bone disease or adynamic bone disease. Again, this is an interesting molecule that we can control by creating a monoclonal antibody that can get attached to sclerostin and can help with the bone formation. Again, this sclerostin in, in lazy patient or patient who do not exercise, they have very high level of sclerostin and they have low bone turnover compared to healthier active patient. So you remember this osteocyte, the, the main reason to activate this osteocyte is to exercise, to be 
uh, ambulating, to be moving. Actually, there is a lot of study that even if we can passively or actively involve our dialysis patient during their session on exercise, we can activate uh, the sclerostin and we can improve the bone formation rate by uh, working on the sclerostin. So there is a phase three trial that has been proven that using uh, romosozumab as a monoclonal antibody to sclerostin can control the bond loss and can improve BMD in two years follow-up study that was published 2017. So again, that's another interesting uh, intervention that we can use for our CKD patients. Another intervention that we can use is active in E. Active in E is highly expressed in the osteocyte. And uh, we published a paper a couple months ago uh, about the uh, abundance and the uh, very high levels of uh, serum active in, Lee, uh, active in E very early in CKD patients. So this active in E actually stimulates the rank L and stimulates the osteoporosis by increasing bone resorption. And as you can see here, in early stages of CKD, the active in level goes up and it correlates well with the degree of the kidney function. And we proved that the serum level of active in E is highly uh, associated and correlated with the activation frequency, bone formation rate, osteoblast and osteoclast function. This means that it's very good parameter for high turnover bone disease. Now we can even use this as diagnostic uh, bi biomarker that we can know exactly what is the uh, bone formation rate and the bone turnover by using the active in A serum level. Also, we can inhibit this active in E by inhibiting its receptor. The receptor 2E for the active in is well identified, and there is experimental studies, uh, and uh, you know most of these experimental studies show that we can control the bone loss and bone resorption by using blockade to this active in E receptors. So osteocyte is the brain cells of the bone. It's a very important cell, just as a metaphor. If the bone is a bird, so it has two wings. One is the osteoclast, one is the osteoblast. But for osteoblast and osteoclast to function and to be synchronized, synchronized together, and for this bird to move and to fly, the signal has to come from the brain, which is the osteocyte. So the osteocyte control both osteoclast and osteoblast, uh, for, you know, and this is orchestrated in the brain of the bone, which is the osteocyte. It's a mechanoreceptor and a stress sensor, so we have to, uh, you know, uh, encourage our patient to be active and to be mobilizing and to exercise for better bone health. Osteocyte is a major endocrine organ. It secretes sclerostin, it secretes FGF23 and clotho. I didn't talk about FGF23 today, but it can, if we need to talk about it, it will need at least uh, you know, one hour to give you some details about the FGF23. But as we all know that FGF23 comes out mainly from the osteocyte. The osteocyte is the major cell producing FGF23. It's FGF23 is a phosphatoric hormone that increases very early in CKD patient to avoid the hyperphosphatemia, but this happens, as we said, as an adaptive mechanism in the beginning. But if we don't control this, this can be associated with increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality because FGF23 stimulate the left ventricular mass and the growth, so increase left ventricular dysfunction, and also cardiovascular calcification, and it's associated with increased cardiovascular morbidities and mortalities. Colotho is the exer of life. Overexpressing colotho uh, increase the survival of rats by about 20%. And this is mainly because it decreases cardiovascular complication, cardiovascular calcification, and it improves the survival. Colotho is a cofactor for the FGF23, and the problem with patients on dialysis or advanced CKD is they have colotho deficiency, 
and the clotho resistance. So they die early because of increased cardiovascular complications and cardiovascular calcifications. Active in E and rank L, both are associated with osteoclast stimulation and osteoclastogenesis. So osteocytes can control the uh, you know, bone turnover by controlling this two molecule as well. So the take home message is, there is a lot of discovery in the field of renal osteodystrophy, and now we understand more in the last 10, 20 years about the cellular activity, the cellular bone activity, and the structure and function of uh, these cells, especially in patients with renal osteodystrophy. It's a therapeutic target, so hopefully in the next couple of decades, we can see more and more of the medication that can control the osteoclast, osteoblast, and the osteocyte function. The thing is, what we know in this field, especially in patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease patient, is much less than what we ignore. There is a very big gap of, of ignorance and uncertainties here, especially when it comes to the renal osteodystrophy and to our vision with renal disease. I hope in the next uh, couple of decades we will see uh, more and more of uh, this discovery and we can unmask the knowledge and the wisdom behind this science. And I will stop by here and uh, again thank you for invi inviting me.